Welcome to the last week of term, what, dead week, I guess. Um, not sure quite why people call it that, but we're not going to talk about any viruses that make anybody sick this week. Woo! <laughs> so uh, much more interesting, and again, you know, classic line to begin my lecture with. We could spend all term talking about the viruses we'll talk about today. Um, so I should just you know, teach virology all the time, every term. It would be great. At least that's what I think. Um, speaking of talking about virology, there's going to be a really fascinating seminar at OHSU at noon today. I will try and find the link. Not quite sure where it is. I, of course, heard about this on Twitter, which is where you go to find out about seminars. Um, Harmeet Malik, who is a, I'm not sure what he would call himself, sort of an evolutionary biologist that works on both viruses and chromosomes and a lot of genetic conflicts, um, has done some really fascinating work and gives a fabulous talk. So that'll be at noon up in Richard Jones Hall, 4330. But again, I'll try and find a link for that and let you know. Um, definitely worth, as far as I'm concerned, the bike up the hill um, to try and hear about this. Um, one of the things that he works on is pox viruses. So that's one of the aspects of things which are actually quite closely linked to what we will be talking about today. Um, last time, I know it feels like forever ago on Friday, we talked about retroviruses, again, something we could spend all term talking about, um, particularly, I think, important and interesting for those retroviruses is the whole replication pathway, again, going from RNA to DNA, integrating into the genome, transcribing it, and then coming back out. And just a quick shout out to the animation that some of us watched at the end. I think it was really useful in terms of thinking about the structure and replication processes. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that, I think it's a really nice review as far as that's concerned. Are there any questions about the retroviruses that have come up as you've been studying them all weekend? OK, so <clears throat> I, I'll have lots for you. Don't worry next Tuesday. So today, again, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, these are the giant viruses, gyruses, et cetera, um, Mimi viruses, FICO DNA viruses, et cetera. This is the lecture that's based on the chapter, or one of the two chapters that's not in the first edition of the textbook. So it's in the second edition, which is on reserve in the library. So um, viruses of algae and Mimi viruses and archaeal viruses. Again, the two lectures we're going to have this week. So these are, even though the virions are really, really big, with a couple of exceptions. Of course, it's always biology and particularly virology. There'll be exceptions. Uh, these have icosahedrally symmetric structures, um, basically shown here. And again, this is a shout out for viral zone, which has these nice, not only cartoons, but also some overviews of each of the individual viruses. So this would be the Mimi virus-like structure and has should be hopefully really obvious, a nice icosahedrally symmetric structure, although as we'll see, it's not completely icosahedrally symmetric. But if someone mean and nasty were to give you something like this in the exam, you could calculate the T number, right? Yes, good. Um, there are some other aspects of these viruses which are really pretty fascinating. One of the authors of the chapter in the second edition of the textbook is a fellow by the name of Willie Wilson. He goes by Willie, yes. Um, who um, talks a lot about how important algal viruses are for climate, et cetera. Um, some of that's maybe a little over the top, but um, I think it's very interesting to think about viruses in an ecological scale and even in a global ecology kind of scale. So we'll talk about that in, in more details today. Um, probably the most interesting and different above and beyond the size of the virions is also the size and really what's present in the genomes of a lot of these viruses. And this is really which has been probably, at least to me, the most surprising. Most people go, oh, wow, these giant viruses, this isn't giantness interesting? No, it's, I think, what's in those giant virions, which is particularly interesting in terms of their sequences. And so this does really bring up the question that we addressed right at the very beginning. What is a virus? And what defines a virus relative to 
what everyone thinks about these, you know, small obligate intracellular parasites. Key concepts, again, a wonderful thing to do in terms of reviewing for the exam next Tuesday. Um, one of the worst acronyms, I think, in virology, the NCLDVs, just completely rolls off the tongue. Um, nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses, blah, 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 blah. Uh, So that's what these viruses are classified together as. And it turns out that there really is a pretty decent correlation of a lot of these giant viruses together. So it does make sense to talk about them in one sort of group. Um, they are incredibly abundant, and probably because there are lots and lots of hosts. And this is particularly true for those algal viruses. We haven't really talked about this much yet, but there are internal lipids present in these viruses. And so this also gets back to the whole definition of a virus. Is it an enveloped virus? Is it a naked virus? So what is going on with this whole classification mechanism? Well, these virions, as you can see, are pretty clearly icosahedral on the outside, and that's just protein. But they have lipids underneath that, and actually have a, kind of a membrane underneath their lipids. And it turns out there are quite a few viruses that do this. There are also bacterial viruses and archaeal viruses that have these as well. And we'll see the archaeal virus next time. Uh, now, horrible acronym, but really fun name for genome release, the Stargate. Um, this is the process whereby, again, the genome is released from inside some of these giant virus particles. And that gets back to the icosahedral symmetry. It turns out that there's one of the five-fold vertices of symmetry that's very different and is this stargate. Virophage, this is something that's not even in the textbook, but we've talked about a little bit already. These giant viruses, which again, tweaking your definition of what a virus is, these get infected by other viruses, um, which are these so-called virophage. And we'll talk a little bit about those um, later on. And then maybe we'll talk about CRISPR, but um, unlikely we'll get to it today. So what's this whole large nuclear cytoplasmic DNA virus story? Um, these are viruses, big replicate in either nucleus or the cytoplasm, and they're DNA viruses. Gee, thanks. Um, but they infect organisms really from almost all three domains of life, definitely known for archaea and bacteria, but mostly eukaryotes and mostly not eukaryotes like the ones that we mostly care about, all the animals and all the plants, but a lot of these other eukaryotes that are very often ignored as far as thinking about Oh, these nasty viruses. Uh, most of the Mimi viruses that have been isolated infect amoeba. And as I mentioned, a lot of these that we'll talk about, at least at the beginning, are algal viruses that infect various different um, algae, some of which are in the um, Euglena group here as well. So, Phycodina viruses. Why the virologists want to not just say DNA or RNA is still beyond me. So, Phyco DNA viruses. Um, the cuckolithoviruses, these are a very specific subset of these phycoDNA viruses, phycoDNA viruses, phycoplankton, so these are the photosynthetic plankton that are being infected. Coccolithophorbs are a subset of those plankton. Um, and we'll talk about the mimi viruses and megaviruses and the whole sort of story here, which I do love about, I'm pretty sure it was um, Willie's section of the chapter, you know, my virus is bigger than your virus kind of thing. Um, I'll actually probably have to say with a French accent, my virus is bigger than your virus, because it's mostly two French groups that are arguing about these things. So um, Pandora virus and pithoviruses, some of my best colleagues are French, some of the best scientists I know are French, so nothing negative there. So uh, why NCLDVs? Um, NCLDVs is actually an acronym made up by a fellow by the name of Eugene Kunin, who's at the National Institutes of Health. And, basically you know, runs GenBank, that's not completely true, um, but is very involved in looking at various different kinds of evolution. And I visited him once there and he said, everyone comes here and they want to see GenBank. Like, well, you don't want to see GenBank. No, it's a whole set of servers that's in some basement, you know, way off in Bethesda. So yeah, no, you're not interested in looking at it. But um, 
that's, he works basically, uh, we go to NCBI, that's, that's his employer. So he came up with this term, um, NCLDVs, because if you do phylogeny and just look at the relationship between a lot of these giant viruses, phycodna viruses, again, these algal viruses that are infecting lots of algae, they're also related to the pox viruses, which we've talked about before, and as we'll see, some of the genome similarities with pox viruses are pretty clear. And the Mimi viruses are also related to these pox viruses, phycodene viruses as well. Um, what's not shown here is that the herpes viruses are clearly not related to these large DNA viruses. So let's talk about the phycodene viruses specifically. These are the algal DNA viruses, and algae here is just eukaryotic algae. Um, there are lots of blue-green algae, which are cyanobacteria, fascinating viruses that infect those, and again, that will be worth the whole course in and of itself. Uh, again, this is potentially a little extreme because Willie wrote this chapter, um, <clears throat> saying that we need algal viruses, but we don't need human viruses in order to stay alive. I would argue that um, placental development is kind of important, too. But uh, these eukaryotic algae um, in the oceans probably produce 50% or more of the world's oxygen just due to photosynthesis. And um, even without land plants, um, these still do a really good job of producing oxygen. But what's different between these algal photosynthesizers and land plants is that, again, the numbers here are pretty wide range, but around 20% of these are probably killed every day due to viral lysis. So there's a huge amount of turnover in terms of all kinds of different nutrients, but probably mostly important are going to be carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen in the oceans because of these algae. And so, you know, yes, they produce oxygen, but oxygen is this nasty, toxic byproduct. Um, what they're really interested in is taking in the energy of sunlight and converting it into fixed carbon that then um, is really the basis for the rest of the marine um, food systems. So in general, this is what these viruses do. The best studied of these viruses is PBCV1, Paramecium bursella chlorella virus. I don't know how many of you looked at Paramecia under the microscope. Um, really cool, um, fascinating structures. Many of them have these small algae that live inside them, um, also known as chlorella. Inside these algae are often viruses which are infecting these chlorella. So really pioneering work, pardon me, um, by Jim Van Etten um, here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, he always introduces himself as the only member of the National Academy of Sciences in the whole state of Nebraska. <clears throat> um, he has really pioneered the work on studying these algal viruses and he was the first one, I think this is from the 70s, to make plaques of viruses on algal cells. So the green in the background here is the chlorella, which is isolated from the paramecium, and all of these plaques are due to the lysis by this PVCV1. Why is this such a neat system? It's so easy to work with that we actually work with. This is in my lab. Um, this is some chlorella right here. Um, this is before it got lysed, this is after it got lysed. Um, and these cells are big enough that you can see them really easily under the microscope. Again, like these chlorella cells. And you can literally see them burst when you have a virus infection. It's really pretty amazing to watch a cell just blast apart when it's getting virus infected. Um, very exciting stuff, at least for me. Um, so this is, again, the best studied of these viruses. Not surprisingly, the genome was one of the first sequenced. But it turns out that it took quite a long time to sequence this because it's a really big genome. Um, this PVCV1 genome is about 300,000 base pairs in length, so that's already bigger than the largest pox virus genomes that we've already talked about, you know, 330.74 thousand base pairs. Um, but just like the pox virus genomes, very similar in terms of genome organization. Linear, closed hairpin ends, inverted repeat sequences, so it probably replicates in a very similar way to pox viruses. We don't completely know whether that's the case or not, 
but it also does have lots of proteins that you would expect in terms of DNA replication. So PCNA, it's hard for you to read this, but that's the proliferating cell nuclear antigen, which is that sliding clamp structure, etc. So pretty standard kinds of things as far as pox viruses from the DNA replication point of view. However, this does not encode an RNA polymerase, so no DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So probably the genome has to get to the nucleus in terms of being transcribed. So similar in terms of DNA replication, different in terms of messenger RNA production, but one of the big surprises was some of the other things which are coded for in this genome. 11 tRNA genes. Why would you have a tRNA gene encoded in a viral genome? Well, it's probably because the codon usage in the viral genome is different than the host codon usage, which is exactly true in this case. So you bring along your own codons, they're not going to get translated properly unless you also bring a whole bunch of tRNAs which are going to be able to um, code for them. But as you remember way back when, thinking about definitions of viruses, viruses all need cellular translation. But less and less of the cellular translation machinery as we'll see as we move through here. Um, this was also the very first viral genome to encode ubiquitin. So um, probably, again, involved in either regulation of cellular processes with additional ubiquitin or stimulating more degradation of various different, probably, again, cellular proteins. This genome also contains a large number of transporter proteins. Again, it was rather strange. People didn't think that virus genomes should have these things. But transporters probably are important for precursors to get more of the virus to be able to be functional. So that's not surprising um, in a bigger picture either. And then the last one that I wanted to mention was that <clears throat> these genomes have self-splicing introns, which are really fascinating RNA-only structures. Um, and I don't know how, you, how many of you went to the chemistry seminar last week where the students were talking about some of their research. Um, one of the researchers there is working in Niles Lehman's lab who works on these self-splicing introns. And so these um, are really interesting RNA structures which may be like RNA in a sort of pre-cellular world in terms of replication processes. So that's the first of these giant genomes, and we'll talk more about some of the repeating themes a little bit later on. What's it's packaged in? Um, packaged in a quasi-icosahedral structure, um, mostly made up of these trimeric double beta barrel structures. And in fact, I brought a 3D printed model of one of these up here. You can come take a look at it after class. So this is three of these double beta barrel structures. And then I've got a couple of the individual molecules here with the double beta barrels themselves. Um, these all fit together in turn to give you one of these you know, really massive, mostly icosahedral structures. So instead of the nice hexagons here, you have trimers of each of these structures, but you could split them up, each of those beta barrels. So this could, you could also think of this as being six beta barrels altogether. Highly glycosylated, not unlike many of the other viruses that we've talked about so far. This glycosylation, interestingly, seems to mostly be dependent on the viral genes. So there are viral genes for glycosylation here, not just cellular genes. And there's also a spike at one of the five-fold axes of symmetry. Um, this should now seem very much like a lot of the bacteriophage we've talked about, icosahedral symmetry, spike at one end of the five-fold symmetry, which should immediately give you an idea how these things are likely to be entering the cell. So yes, interacts through this spike mechanism on the exterior of the cell. Why did, why did bacteriophage have these tails, we think? Who's up next? Helen Lee? No, Getran, 
Commander. Nobody here today? <laughs> James, I saw you in the back. My question is, why do we think that most bacteriophage have tails? Drill through the membrane. So, um, what do you think is going on here? Drilling through the membrane. <laughs> um, although in this case, it's a cell wall. So, bacteria usually have pretty tough outsides. Plant walls even tougher. So, what are the plant viruses that we've talked about so far? What have they had in terms of getting inside cells? Right, so they do something to chew through. Here, we're talking algae, so there are not many, well, there are some grazers that'll deal with this, protus grazers, but generally you don't have anything that's gonna be chewing through. And so it seems these guys have enzymes associated with the tip of that tail in order to bore through. But in general, same idea. You got this spike in order to drill through the outside of the cell in terms of getting in. As I mentioned before, but we didn't look at this, there's a internal membrane on these viruses, again, underneath that protein coat. That internal membrane now seems to fuse with the plasma membrane. So once you get through the cell wall as a membrane, you have membrane fusion that takes place, and <clears throat> the genome is released, but you still have the capsid left on the outside of the cell. And not surprisingly, again, this looks a lot like what you have in terms of bacteriophage infection. Membrane depolarization happens, not surprisingly, when you're drilling holes through it, you're going to have trouble keeping that chemiosmotic gradient. May be important for the virus infection process. It's not entirely clear if that's the case. Once we get in, as we mentioned, these genomes don't have DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, so presumably they need to get into the nucleus. And then once they actually get into the nucleus, one of the things I didn't mention, there also are a number of endonucleases that are encoded in the virus genome, which are breaking down the cellular DNA. And that's probably to give the viruses DNA to deal with. Now, how they protect their own DNA from getting degraded by these endonucleases is also not entirely clear, but that process of degrading cellular DNA she turns out to be something that is found in, in many other systems as well, and we'll see some of the other <coughs> viruses as well. Yeah. Okay. How does the genome get inside the nucleus? Um, again, not entirely clear, that process. Um, whether it's breaking down the nuclear membrane in order to get in. Again, these are pretty big genomes. They're you know, 300 KB. Um, there's no obvious import. There's no sort of, you know, VPR protein like you have in HIV. So, yeah, they get there. How they get there is not entirely clear. Yeah, so nuclear localization signals are really well studied in mammalian cells, but very little is known about what nuclear localization signals are in um, chlorella in these algae, so you can make some predictions, but it's basically this one lab that's doing it, and so they've found things that they think are most interesting, and they follow up on those. So um, there probably are lots of proteins from nuclear localization signals, but it's not entirely known how that works. Um, so one thing that I <clears throat> particularly wanted to mention here, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about the pox viruses. You remember they're assembling in these sort of areas outside of the nucleus. Not surprising, they're all replicating in the cytoplasm. Uh, but the same thing is going on here with the P PBCV1, but also, as we'll see with all of these other giant viruses, there's a separate almost organelle that forms inside the cytoplasm where you have assembly of all of these virus particles. So here is a little hard to see. Um, C stands for cytoplasm, N stands for nucleus, but this is the nuclear membrane right here. Almost all of the rest of the cell has all of these virions at various stages of being assembled in this virus factory. Um, and you can see this, and we'll see it again as we look at some of the other um, giant viruses a little bit later on. And then how are these, cell, how are these viruses released? Again, by lysing the cell, and again, you can literally see this under the microscope. Um, you've got happy cells that actually start to expand a little bit, probably because there's virions inside them, and then eventually they, they pop open. 
really fascinating process. But again, very similar to what you see with bacteria phage. So shift gears a little bit, talk about the coccolithoviruses. Um, coccolithophores are some of the most common algae that you find in the oceans. They have these amazing plate-like structures on the outside. This is just one of them, um, Emiliana hexlei. And this particular one has a virion attached to the outside of it. So this is the, the virion here. Here's the um, Emiliana huxley eye. Um, so these plates on the outside, um, they're calcareous plates, um, basically calcium carbonate. Um, and when you have a lysis of these algae, they make these really amazing, as they, <laughs> Willie Wilson particularly is like to call these, um, oceanic plaques. So this is, you have the ocean, which is your petri plate, and then you have these plaques that form um, due to the lysis of these ridiculously large numbers, you know, 10 to the 20 odd of these particular um, algae, algal blooms. You've probably heard about some of the toxic algal blooms say in Salem, so you couldn't drink the water for days. Um, these things happen in the oceans as well. It's a boom or bust kind of cycle. The end of almost all of these, at least the marine algal cycles, probably true for a lot of these freshwater cycles as well, which is why I need some samples from Detroit Lake so I can look for viruses in them, um, is due to viral infection. And so you're blowing apart the cell as you were here, and now, in the case of these coccolithophores, releasing all of these plates, which form these plaques. So question is, you know, what about using viruses as you know, biocontrolled agents to end some of these algal blooms? I think people have thought about it. The problem with that is that usually the algal blooms have such a high number of hosts that the amount of virus you would have to add um, is really, really high. And it's a self-amplifying process that seems to be happening here as you have, um, we. Did we, talk, I said, did we talk about kill the winner um, at the very beginning of the class? So the idea is that viruses in ecological situations, um, they're usually present at relatively low levels. And as long as the hosts aren't at too high a level, the virus is going to have trouble finding its host. But if the hosts go to really high levels, then it's going to be really easy for the viruses to find those and then get rid of those. So if anybody, anybody gets out of line, you know, gets too big for their britches, then they get taken out by the viruses. At least that's the, the idea. So maybe you could have infected cells that you would put into one of these systems and then hopefully get them to um, amplify. It's, it's a fascinating system, and I'd really love to, to look into that in a little bit more detail. In fact, we've got a, someone who's working on Lake Oswego trying to look at algal blooms, and I said, can you look at algal blooms? Let's see if we can get some other samples to take a look at a little later on. So, um, but yes, that's, um, it's a great idea, and people are certainly thinking about it for some of these um, toxins. Unfortunately, another problem with that is many of the toxins they aren't actually released by the algae themselves, but they're released from the algae when they're lysed. So lysing a whole bunch of them, yes, you lower the amount of algae, but you might also increase the amount of toxin in the process. Okay, but yeah, so these um, numbers here, and also um, Willie is really into saying that um, these <coughs> calcium carbonates, what has happened is you know, have these massive blooms, Again, you can see all of this calcium carbonate from space. But what happens is this will eventually deposit at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then those get uplifted. And so the white cliffs of Dover mostly are made up of these coccolithophores. And so he says this is a really you know, large biosignature evidence for viruses are these you know, literally 1,000 foot high cliffs because they've lysed due to all of this virus infection process. Rather indirect, but still. Um, the numbers here, you know, the important thing is there really is a numbers game. There are very large numbers of hosts and very large numbers of viruses that are associated with it. And because of that, you can also have viruses changing the weather. So the idea here is, again, with these coccolithophores, particularly Mandiana huxleyi, when they get lysed, they release dimethyl sulfate. Dimethyl sulfate gets into the atmosphere. Um, becomes a sulfuric acid. These sulfuric acid particles then can serve as cloud nucleation points. These cloud nucleation points then make clouds reflect the sunlight. 
And what that means is you have less photons coming in, less photosynthesis, less algal growth. So killing off the viruses, the viral bloom with the viruses, will also suppress the growth at that point of all algae and not just the coccolithophores um, which have been produced. So sort of a homeostasis loop um, based on the DMS, but also what's not shown here is what's happening to all of the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which is released on all of this lysis. So large numbers, you actually start to see some changes happening on a much more macro scale um, than we always like to think about infection of you know, one human, as it were. Um, so that's the ecology, what's happening inside the virus. This is the genome of the first of these Huxley virus genomes to be studied. Even bigger, 400,000 base pairs. This guy does encode its own RNA polymerase, so probably is replicating the cytoplasm. Also, it's got all of the DNA polymerases, etc. Also has genes that are related to other nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. So it's clearly part of that same group of viruses. Some of the big differences that it has, first is lots and lots of genes that don't match anything. So the dark matter of sequence space here, um, and even more and more sequences of genomes still, many of these large viruses don't have sequences that look like any other sequence that people have seen before. Some of the few genes, the 20% that do match anything, seem to be involved in making some very specific sphingolipids, ceramide biosynthesis. And again, usually viruses are taking cellular lipids in terms of making their virions. Well, these viruses take cellular lipids and highly modify them and make their own lipids, internal lipids, again, it's confused with the membrane after you have degradation of the, um, the host on the outside. One interesting aspect about these specific viral lipids is that you can actually use these now to detect viruses or to detect a virus infection. So people have literally taken ships and cruised across the North Atlantic sampling as they go along. And if they see these virus-specific lipids, it's an indication that they've had these virus infections that have happened there. And so that's the process of where these um, virus lipids are. Again, they're all proteins that are encoded in the viral genome. Some of these may also be important for apoptosis. So the lipids that are made, these ceramides, are very well known in terms of regulating apoptosis in normal cells. Very little is known about apoptosis that happens in some of these coccolithophores. So we assume that these viral lipids may also be involved in regulating apoptosis, which as we talked about before, particularly for adenoviruses, there's suppression of apoptosis because you don't want the cell to self-destruct before it has a chance to make lots of virus and virions. But in some cases, apoptosis is good if it happens late enough in the process because that will also help to release some of these um, cells. So that's um, again, a little unclear exactly what the ceramide is doing in terms of apoptosis, but it's clearly important for making the viral lipids. Um, and so viral lipid metabolism enzymes, um, not surprising. What's happening to our world, despite what certain politicians may say, um, the climate is changing. One of the big things that people don't talk about is the acidification of the oceans. Uh, and the pH is definitely going down in the oceans. This is going to have a real major effect on these coccolithophores because the precipitation of that calcium carbonate um, can actually be reversed. They can start to dissolve. And so whether the climate change and ocean acidification is going to be a problem in terms of release of some of these extra coccolithophores and maybe having more viruses will allow us to have a, as they say, a buffer in terms of this change in, in climate. That's a lot of stuff to think about so far. Should we go ahead and ask a 
Baker question to allow me to have a break? Yes, I know you wanted that. Yes. <laughs> okay, so start. So it's not 90%, so tell each other what you decided. And then you know, maybe I should let you come and look at the, the structures up here as well. Ready to go again? We weren't at 90% last time, so let's see if we get to 90% or 100% this time. Ten, five, okay, what do we have here in terms of, so we've got lambda, herpes simplex virus, sulfobus turi, dicosahedral virus, simian virus 40, and tobacco mosaic virus. Nobody liked TMV, that's good. Um, SV40 has a single beta barrel structure. Herpes simplex virus has an HK97 like fold. And we didn't really talk about this. Did we talk at all about the lambda structure? No, we didn't. So what does that leave us with? STIV, which is this structure. This is the PBCV1 structure. And this is the PRD1 structure. <laughs> for the 14 of you who got it right, no, heck no, you're going to get points for that. Okay, so let's talk about Mimi viruses plus. Um, these are the ones with the really big virions. And I promised viral factories earlier. Um, here's the viral factory in a poor cell which has been infected by one of these Mimi viruses. Um, this is the nucleus. All these other spots are virions here. 
and even in the light microscope, you can see all of these virions. The first time that I saw a picture like this, I was like, oh my god, I can see a virion in the light microscope. It's just so amazing and cool. Again, I'm maybe not normal. But that's... <laughs> Um, I was really pretty amazed. I always learned, you know, viruses are small, but no, you can actually see these guys in the light microscope. So the first of these to be studied is the um, APMV, Acanthamoeba polyphaga mimi virus. No, I'm not going to ask you that. Um, mimi virus. Why mimi virus? Because it mimics a bacteria, basically just in terms of size. And here you can see one of these virions inside an amoeba. And the vast majority of these giant viruses have been found um, in amoeba. And if you measure all the way across here, it's about 750 nanometers, which means that you actually can see it um, in the light microscope. Uh, APMV was originally found in a cooling tower um, and was called Bradfordococcus because it was in Bradford, England that it was found. Um, Bradfordococcus, this is yeah, bacteria. OK, we've got this bizarre bacteria we find in our cooling towers. Um, but we can't work with it because we can't grow it and because we also can't find any ribosomal sequences in it. That's very strange. Um, took about 11 years to figure out that it was, in fact, a virus. And the only reason that people figured that out was because they finally found a host for these viruses, which were these amoeba. And so here's from that, um, actually not, I think this one's the original paper. Um, nucleus, virus factory, and then all of these amoeba viruses associated with it. Just for comparison, this is variola. Um, this is about half of the size of just the internal virion without the tail structures on either side of it. So. Um, as big as a bacterium, and in fact, in the original paper, they've got mycoplasma and the mimivirus virion right next to each other, and they're basically indistinguishable, at least at, at that kind of scale. Um, not surprisingly, with these really big virions, they also have big genomes. This genome is not full of junk. That's what a lot of people thought was going to be the case when they sequenced this over million base pair genome. Um, they figured it was going to be you know, all kinds of extra introns and so on and so forth, just like our genome. No, just like most viral genomes, coding sequences, almost all coding sequence in it. RNA polymerase, again, not surprising. DNA polymerases, basically all the machinery that it needs for transcription, replication, but also a bunch of other translation proteins. tRNAs, yes but also amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So the protein, which takes the tRNA, puts the appropriate amino acid on it. Um, I think there were three or four that were found um, in this genome. First genome ever to find those that had the amino acyl tRNA synthetases on them. But in retrospect, that kind of makes sense. If you've got a bunch of extra tRNAs that you need in terms of making your genome, translating it into protein, because you're using a bunch of rare codons, not surprising that you're going to have some of these amino acyl tyranate synthetases as well. There's also the very first example of a cap binding protein, um, EIF4E equivalent, that's found in these genomes. And translational initiation factors. So you've got tRNA, you've got amino acyl tRNA synthetases, you've got cap binding proteins, also not mentioned here. We've got all of the capping enzymes, the tailing enzymes, et cetera. So what are we missing? Ribosome. And still missing the ribosome. And none of these things actually have ribosomes in them. But uh, I'm wondering if it, someday we're going to find a virus genome that has, say, one of the subunits of the ribosome in it. We shall see. But so far, um, no ribosomes, but practically everything else um, right now. So genomes kind of almost look like a cell. Um, but the structure of the virion looks very, very different. So quasi-icosahedral, our T number is you know 11,079. No, I'm not going to expect you to calculate that. But also with these internal lipid layers, um, protein on the outside, these filaments attached to 
the proteins, and then internal lipid layers with a protein core. Um, this protein core actually looks really similar to the protein core that you see in some of the pox viruses. Um, lots and lots of proteins are also present in the virion. Again, a lot like what you see with the pox viruses. Um, why do you have all of these fibers? Um, probably the reason that all of these fibers are here is to fool the poor amoeba into thinking that you're food. So how do amoeba eat? They eat my phagocytosis, go around and grab things, um, and then figure they will be able to break it down. Well, what happens in this case, instead of being broken down, now the genome of this virus is released into the amoeba, and the amoeba is uh, toast, I guess, one way of looking at it. So how does the genome get released? Um, this is one of, I think, the most fascinating aspects about these viruses is the so-called stargate. How do we know about the stargate? Well, when you, if you look at these virus particles, and again, they're really big. So you can use scanning electron microscopy. You can um, even <clears throat> look at these um, also with cryo-EM, and we'll see a cryo-EM image in just a second here. But SEM, you can look really nicely at single particles, and literally single particles, not averaging all of them together. And at one of the five-fold axes, they saw these really interesting structures, which look like, you know, a, almost like a starfish, that if you now look later on um, in the infection process, you can see here, this is the vacuole that the amoeba has used. Then there's this fusion event that takes place here through the opening up of this structure. Um, these are some SEMs of looking at this. How many of you know what this is? The alien pod, exactly. So um, the release of the alien from here. What about this one? The Stargate, exactly. <laughs> so not, it should have been five-fold symmetric, but you know, they didn't know at the time. So <clears throat> let's um, take a look here at this structure. Um, this is now the, pardon me, get this over here. The cryo-EM reconstruction. Let's go back, take a look at it. Of these Mimi viruses, again, with this stargate at one of the five-fold axes of symmetry, all of the other five-fold axes of symmetry seem to be relatively normal. Again, with just this one asymmetry, which is present at this five-fold axis, which then, again, will open up in terms of giving you the release of the genome. So basically, how does the stargate open, I guess, is, is another way of, of looking at that question. Um, so there's probably some kind of protein-protein interaction that happens there. It's not obviously a change in pH that is happening. Um, the, exact, the exact process and how these things work has been Again, kind of like the algal viruses, you know, these things don't make people sick, and so do we really care about them? They're really, really cool, but really, really cool doesn't usually get you very much money from granting agencies. So that's, um, I think, partly why we don't know very much about how that is, in fact, triggered. Um, there may be some more information on that. I don't know. It is interesting that it does seem to be very well conserved in a lot of these giant viruses. So what is the replication cycle of these? Um, again, we have a Mimi virus that will associate with the <clears throat> outside. And this apparently doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be obvious receptor interactions. It's just the amoeba eats these things almost definitely by mistake. Um, and then once you have the virion will then fuse, the genome is released, you have formation of a viral factory starts to make lots and lots of virions, these virions then end up escaping from the cell. And so here's another example of each of these virions, formation of the stargate, release of the genome, and then this genome starts to be 
forming. And this is a, one of these viral factories. Here's where you have all of the transcription, all of your replication, everything taking place at these viral factories, and then production of each of these <clears throat> virions. And again, the, the whole process will, will continue. This process takes about 12 hours for APMV and probably true for a lot of these other um, giant viruses. And it really does, you know, the viral factory ends up being way bigger than the nucleus in many of these cases. So clearly a mistake for the amoeba to try and be eating these things. So this was um, APMV, again, the Mimi virus found in this cooling tower. Um, then, and in fact, that first paper was published with two French groups collaborating with each other, Jean-Michel Claverie and Didier Raoul. Um, and then each of them decided they wanted to find their own giant virus. So my virus would be bigger than your virus. And so that's where this process went from there. But first, what's your question? Do you have a question, Nicole? Or not? No, it's just stretching. It's fine. So um, if you have a mini virus, what's next? A mega virus. So um, this was published in 2011. It's actually a slightly larger genome, um, but not that much. Seven amino acid sulfuronate synthetases, 23 genes that aren't similar to Mimi viruses. And um, let's see, I think we'll actually skip this um, interview with Jean Michel, who basically says, Yes, I'm, I'm the most wonderful person and scientist in the world. Um, and, but um, Didier Raoul apparently also has a bust of himself in his apartment. It's also interesting. So uh, now, so we had. Um, we had some issues with people getting 100% on the last one, so let's get 100% on this one the first time around. <laughs> Stedman's being schizophrenic. <laughs> See, I wasn't going to throw out the other question. Now, should I throw this one out? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, somebody's pushing pushing the, pushing my buttons again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Five. Okay, better make sure you make that last vote count. <laughs> I could, yeah. <laughs> I'm not that mean, though. Nobody liked my large T antigen. So if we ever don't know what the answer is, just you know, put large T antigen. You can't figure out a wrong answer to put down, put large T antigen. So giving away my secrets here in terms of exam questions writing. Okay, so I mentioned that these, you know, you know, my virus is bigger than your virus and blah, blah, blah. And we'll see a few more of those in just a second here. But getting back to the idea that these viruses, at least their virions, are really big. Their genomes contain basically everything that they need in order to replicate by themselves, with the exception of the ribosome. They form all of these viral factories. Um, so they're really kind of acting pretty autonomously. So it's not at all surprising that there are parasites of these viruses. Um, and again, not thinking about viruses from the virion point of view, but thinking about viruses from the whole life cycle point of view. So these are what are called the virophage. So um, this is one of my favorite images of a Mimi virus that now has inside its virion has all of these other little virions of a completely different, there's no sequence similarity here whatsoever between these viruses that are infecting these viruses. They all replicate next to the virus factory. Here you can see these little virions um, inside the virus factory. And if you have an infection with these virophage, the yield of the Megavirus, Mimi virus, etc., is much, much lower. Yeah. How do you find a virus that infects a virus? So that's a really good question. 
Um, and I happen to know some of the people who do some of this, so I do know how the process was done. Basically, they were looking at these infection processes and seeing, oh, look, we have this infection, and literally, I think in some cases, like a thousand of viruses are being produced, thousand variants are being produced in any given system. And they were looking for more and more of these giant viruses. And then they found a, uh, a case where they were getting really small amounts of these giant viruses being produced. They're like, oh, what the heck's going on here? Usually it produces a whole bunch. And then they looked carefully and said, oh, these, these little particles in here as well. And so eventually then they purified those to the sequences of, of those particles. So they were literally looking for giant viruses and found these small viruses in that whole process. Um, and the original one was called Sputnik, um, I think potentially because was a bunch of Russians who were working on this project as well as the French. Um, and so this is Sputnik. But it turns out that this is present in many of these giant viruses. There's a giant viruses that, in, it's a giant virus, excuse me, that infects a, another algae called cafeteria. Cafeteria? What, cafeteria virus? No, it's not norovirus. It's a virus that's infecting this algae. Um, cafeteria roburgensis um, virus. Um, which produces also these giant viruses, also has a virophage that's associated with them. And it's probably true for almost all of these giant viruses. They also have these virophage that are associated with them as well. So that process um, does seem to be a, a pretty common one. Partly why they're called virophage is there are a number of sequences in these virophage genomes that look more like bacterial viruses than they do like eukaryotic viruses. Yeah, I don't So how do these guys reproduce if there's no ribosome in the megavirus? Right, so where would the translation be? If you look at that virus factory, so they're mostly infecting the virus in the virus factory. Sometimes they end up in these virions, but that's probably actually a false case. They just end up, you know, we're packaging, you're also packaging some of these other ones um, together. But the actual ribosome which they're using is still the cellular ribosome, just like the giant virus is using. So what seems to happen is they come in simultaneously. So you've got a, and again, these are engulfment. So when the amoeba engulfs one of these megaviruses, it also is engulfing some of these virophage. They all come inside. How the virophage gets out of the um, vacuole is not entirely clear because it doesn't have a nice stargate. It doesn't obviously have any kind of tail structure. Um, but then it ends up in the viral factory. And in the viral factory, it makes more of virophage. But it is dependent on the viral factory. These things cannot replicate by themselves. On the hair structures on the uh, the megaviruses, yeah, probably they're just you know, out there to say tell the um, or amoeba, hey, I'm yummy, you know, eat me. Um, but that's as far as there's no like obvious um, receptor receptor binding or anything, because a lot of these do have these fibrils on the outside, and it's not at all clear why you would have them. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is um, basically, and it's actually something that I argued with the um, original author of this paper about quite a bit. <laughs> so the question is, are these, can you really think of them as viruses, or are they something which is coming along for the ride? Um, and this actually gets back to what I was mentioning when they were discovered in the first place. You had much lower yields of the megavirus when you had these virophage around. So that virophage definitely lowers the amount of production of the megavirus. And so in the absence of that, you'll have a lot bigger production. In the presence of it, it's much lower. So they argue that that's much more like a virus process. I think is a reasonable argument. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the um, question is, you know, could the virophage be associated with these hair structures? So is there a virophage hiding out here? Maybe. 
I really don't know. <laughs> Got me. Good. Um, yeah, so this is what happens when you're looking for giant viruses. Sometimes you'll find these really small ones, which are um, infect them as well. But you can also find ridiculously large viruses. So um, the Pandora viruses, um, this is again a light micrograph looking at these guys. Um, this is now 200 nanometers. These guys are almost a micron in length, which is just crazy. And they clearly do not have a nice icosahedral structure. They're just big kind of blobs. Um, and this was all coming from looking for big viruses that infected amoeba. So basically, get a sample from somewhere, bring it back to the lab, see if it'll grow in your amoeba. And they found these just absolutely ridiculously enormous virions. Not surprisingly, the ridiculously enormous virion also has a ridiculously enormous genome. Two and a half million base pairs for these genomes which is larger than some of the smallest eukaryotic genomes. 7% of this genome is similar to known proteins, clearly very distantly related to some of these mimiviruses. And again, these people will argue whether they're similar or less similar to each other. One of the groups said that, oh, well, this is really clear evidence that these are derived from a fourth domain of life. Remember, we looked at you know, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. There's this extinct fourth domain that all of these guys have developed from. That's rather controversial, and most people actually don't agree that that's the particular case. Um, many of these virus genes um, are also quite similar to amoeba genes. So if anything, they've picked up some of those amoeba genes. And also, there's lots and lots of gene duplication that has happened in many of these genomes but ridiculously enormous. Um, these are now all isolated viruses. Not surprisingly, this has provided a whole bunch of genes, many of which are not similar to anything else, that now people are using when they go to metagenome sequences. So George talked about metagenomes. You go out into an environment, you find virus-sized particles, and you sequence the dot, dot, dot out of them. Um, and what has been found are a number of these viruses that are clearly related. Again, this is a phylogeny. Um, there's that cafeteria roburgensis virus I mentioned, all of the mini viruses, the canthamoeba megaviruses, and then this whole new group of viruses called close noi viruses, which are just because, you know, close to Neuberg, which is where they found these original sequences, in the best place to find viruses, a sewage treatment plant. So, all of these sequences, big genomes, a whole bunch of amino acid triadenyl synthetases, a whole bunch of tRNAs as well. But all of this was just from metagenome sequences until a really talented graduate student who almost came to PSU but went to University of British Columbia and said, um, came up with this virus, the Bodo Salthouse virus which is, again, a pretty typical one of these giant viruses, um, has a big genome, not quite as much, same transcription and replication, only has a few amino acyl tRNA synthesis and no tRNAs, which is actually really kind of strange, um, but has these um, homing endonucleases and um, intense. Those are supposed to be introns. Um, Got to love um, <laughs> autocorrect here. And just I wanted to finish off with the biggest virion so far found. It's the pithovirus. Um, this was found again by the French group going and finding viruses that infected amoeba. 1.5 microns across. Interestingly enough, its genome is actually smaller than the Pandora virus genome. Um, and why you have something that's this big relative to some of the, the normal sized virions is really um, kind of crazy. And last month, no, two months ago, Oh, no, it's June. Wow, how did that happen? <laughs> Four months ago, um, they discovered this giant virus with a tail that I'm not going to talk about anymore because it's already kind of 